Hey, good morning, everybody. I am Jim Hoffman. I have the privilege of being pastor at St. John's United Methodist Church in Midtown Kansas City. It is Wednesday, June the 17th. It's time for our daily devotion. So we're going to take a couple minutes and just welcome folks as they sign in and join us for uh, this time. And then here in a couple minutes, we will take an opportunity to actually have our devotion time. I want to thank everybody that's going to be here today and be present with us. Looking forward to this time. I always do. Hi, Marie. Good morning to you. Hi, Garth. Hi, Cherry. Glad you're with us this morning. Good morning, Murray. Good morning, Linda. Hi, Barbara Paddock. Glad you're with us today. Good morning to you. Hi, Barbara and Chris Mueller. Glad you're with us. Hi, Diane. Good morning to you. Let's see who else pops in here and joins us this morning. I'm grateful all of you are here so far. Real quickly, just to let you know, we are going to be reading out of Romans chapter 8, verses 25 to 28. Hi, Cindy. Good morning to you. Good morning, Shirley. Glad you're here today. Hi, Julie. Good morning to you. Hi, Susie. Good morning to you. Glad you're both with us as well. As I said a moment ago, we're going to be reading out of Romans chapter 8. So if you have your Bible and you want to turn there, please do so. Hi, Jack. Hi, Pat. Glad you're with us this morning. We'll wait another, oh, 30 seconds or so. I want to make sure everybody has a chance to join that wants to join us for the live event. And then we'll take an opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me, to have our time of devotion together. Hi, Susan. Good morning to you. There might be a couple of other folks that will kind of join us in midstream, but I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll get ourselves started this morning. So our uh, reading this morning is from Romans chapter 8, and we're going to read verses 25 to 28. And here is what Paul writes in his letter to Rome. But if we have hope for what we don't see, we wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit comes to help our weakness. We don't know what we should pray, but the Spirit itself pleads for our, call, our case with unexpected groans. The one who searches hearts knows how the Spirit thinks because it pleads for the saints consistent with God's will. We know that God works all things together for good and for the ones who love God, for those who are called according to God's purpose. And the um, focused verse that our author um, picked was Romans chapter 8, verse 26. It says, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, <clears throat> but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Our author is Marcy Farr from Texas, and this is what she shares with us as her thoughts for today. This one's a firecracker. The pediatrician said, when my husband and I took our first child for her one-year physical. Extroverted and confident, Madison has lived up to that description ever since. Her little sister, Anna, is different. If someone outside our immediate family talked to Anna when she was younger, she would lower her gaze and bury her face in my neck. 
Concerned about Anna's shyness, I asked my Bible study group to pray for her to come out of her shell. Some wise, experienced mothers counseled me that Anna would eventually find her way in the world on her own terms. Then I realized that I had been praying for the wrong thing, focusing on what would make me comfortable instead of what would make Anna comfortable. Rather than praying for God to change Anna, I should have been praying for God to change me. When I changed my prayers, my stress over Anna's shyness lifted. At the age of nine, Anna surprised everyone when she began acting and singing and continued these activities all the way through high school. God had worked through the Holy Spirit and my wise friends to guide my prayers to help me let Anna be Anna. Thought for the day, when I listen for the Holy Spirit, my prayers can more fully follow God's will. Um, I I was uh, uh, thinking about this in particular, and um, it is interesting. Uh, if you read Peter Steinke, um, uh, he's an author that I've I've read a few of his books, primarily read them in my um, doctoral program and things like that, but. Uh, Peter Steinke talks about and uses the phrase that's become fairly well known about being a non-anxious presence, right? And that um, we humans, particularly in leadership kinds of roles um, or visible roles, we have to figure out how, try, how to try to be in anxious times someone who does not attribute to more anxiety within whatever system you operate, right? So pastors are, are taught and and encouraged to try to figure out how to be a non-anxious presence in the middle of anxious systems and, and anxious times. And so sometimes that can be, can be seen as being aloof. Um, sometimes that can be seen as being uncaring um, or those kinds of things um, versus someone who is trying to figure out how to mediate a response to the circumstance and the situation that you find yourself in. Um, and so for some people who are anxious about certain things, uh, if they don't hear from their leader uh, in what they think is a timely manner, then, then it just simply adds to their anxiety. It adds more anxiousness to the system, right? And it becomes a, a kind of problematic in its own ways. And what we try to do is, is because of our anxiety, we try to change other people, their behaviors, uh, thoughts, you know, d different things. We try to get them to change um, so, that, so that it calms our anxiety. Right? I, I read a recent quote from um, Ruth Haley Barton, who is an author and a writer. Um, and she said that 46% of pastors are stressed and anxious. And it's not because they are overworked um, or because they are, um, you know, somehow in, in, the, in the middle of all that's going on, feeling extra pressure or anything like that. Uh, they, they say that 46% of them are stressed out because they're trying to figure out how to navigate the waters of competing expectations from parishioners. Um, because we've we've accentuated maybe the job description of a pastor in this modern era, and and different people expect different things until you find yourself in an anxious system because of all of these competing expectations and the number of people who just can't figure out how to navigate that. Um, number one and number two don't have the skill set necessarily to meet every single one of those expectations. Um, you know, my maybe one of my my things or one of one of the things I battle with is is my um, constant desire to please everybody. I I hate to disappoint someone or feel like I've disappointed someone. Right, and, and so that's something that you know I know that I I work on as my own kind of anxiousness. Right, and how that um, how that kind of plays out in our system at St. John's or not. The interesting thing that um, that this article points out, though, is, is how often we strive to change someone else, right? This mother who was trying to figure out how to change 
her daughter in a way that would relieve her own anxiety and her own discomfort, rather than simply saying to God, you know, help me understand my discomfort and help me to support uh, this person, my child or whomever, right? And I, I would say that, that maybe in our own system uh, uh, as a community of faith and things like that, that may be a better way for us to operate together as a community is, is that we, we look at ways in which we can support those around us rather than trying to change those around us. You know, we try to change one another, you know, the person that's sitting in the pews next to us um, or the person that's leading worship that day or the person that leads a particular ministry or, or something along those lines. And maybe our prayer should be, Lord, what is it within me that needs to change? How do, how do I allow you, through the power of your spirit, to address my tension, my anxiety, my concern, my whatever that it is that, that I'm wrestling with? There, I think, is where the work of the spirit is, and that's where the work of God is, is, is in the changing of us, not the, the constant projection of others' need to change, and how God empowers us to be able to deal with our anxiety and deal with our stress in healthy ways that brings about the best for ourselves in this, right? And still still allows us to continue in our relationships that are meaningful, right? And so I want to encourage you to think about that today. What has been the prayer that you've been praying about someone else? Right? You know, that, that prayer that you've been saying, God, you need to change X, Y, or Z. You need to change this about this person, right, in order for me to love them more, in order for me to be able to be in fellowship with them or friendship with them. And instead, maybe we need to amend our prayers and say, God, what is it within me that needs to change today? How do I allow that person to be the person they are and not have my anxiety um, mitigate or my anxiety rule in our relationship? And so I want you to, to think about that for a moment. Pause and pray. Ask God to, to give you the ears that you might listen to the Spirit and that your prayer might move you more fully to follow God's will for you. And that maybe we begin to think about, you know, shaping and forming a different prayer model than Lord change this person. So let's take a moment to pause and to pray. Lord, we ask that you help us to listen for your spirit's guidance so that you might put our prayers on the right track. Help us to pray about change that needs to happen within us and the way in which we need to be the person you desire us to be. So often we want to form someone else in our image, in the type of person that we want them to be and become. And yet, Lord, we know that they are a unique individual. They are their own person, your own creation of them. And so we pray, Lord, that um, through our anxiousness and our stress, you might work to change us. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I hope this was a helpful devotion for you today. It might not have been. It might have been. But uh, in either way, I would encourage you to take a moment, if you would, please, to also um, take an opportunity to change. And, uh, change. <laughs> I just saw Kyle's comment that says, me change. Oh, my. <laughs> so... <laughs> I would encourage you to take a moment maybe to share this post with those that are on your own Facebook feed and are your friends so that they might have an opportunity to share in our daily devotions together. Um, I hope also that you have a blessed and wonderful afternoon. And um, uh, again, I want to remind you that we'll be on here tomorrow, 1145. So come and join us today or tomorrow for our time of devotion. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you didn't hear um, 
Uh, faith communities from the Kansas City area are gathering to, on Friday evening, not tomorrow evening, on Friday evening from 7 to 8 on the east side of Truce, somewhere between 50, uh, somewhere up and down the 10 mile stretch. But uh, uh, several of us United Methodist communities are going to be somewhere between 54th and 63rd Street on the east side of Truce. Margaret and I are going to stake out a position at 60th and Truce. We're going to be there for what's called the, the time of pray for our um, pray for our community. And so we want to invite you to come and join us for that. Uh, bring a mask. We'll do, a, you know, the appropriate physical distancing, those kinds of things. But um, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have a particular Bible verse about justice and peace that you want to bring, I'd encourage you to bring a sign that, that maybe has a, a good Bible verse about peace and justice and, and reconciliation on it. Um, and um, hope that many of us will take an opportunity to come and be a part of this. It is about it is about the faith communities of Kansas City joining together to pray as an activity of change. Um, and I would encourage you to consider coming and being a part of that with the many of us that are planning it. Um, I think it will be a wonderful experience for all of us and an encouraging time. So I want to encourage you to think about that. Uh, otherwise, I um, will look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. Hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Enjoy it as much as you can. And God's peace and blessings be upon you.